everybody. Welcome um, to our next talk. So I'm introducing George Sanford, who's our talker today. Um, and oh, give me one second here. Get adjusted. Uh, so his pronouns are he, him. Uh, George has over 20 years of experience helping clients solve their IT and security challenges through firsthand engagement, leading exceptional teams, and focusing on customer success. He's a passionate advocate for building a more effective and positive security community through expanding diversity and inclusion, mentorship, and helping individuals and teams reach their best potential. He's also co-founder of OK2 Ask for Help and currently leads the CS security team at Fortnite. Thanks. Thank you so much. Morning. So tough going in the morning. I'm much more of a night person, so, and especially following Tanya, I'm like, sorry. Outstanding. So anybody get nervous public speaking? Am I the only one? So anybody know what this is? So what do they call it? And power pose, what else do they call it? Hero pose, exactly. So this is supposed to make you feel a little more comfortable and empowered, etc. For me, it doesn't work. So I still get nervous, so I apologize if I speed up or slow down. And I'm gonna ditch the cape for this, but uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for spending some time. I uh, wanted to thank uh, Diana Initiative not only for giving me uh, space to speak today, but also for holding this conference. I was uh, fortunate enough to be here last year um, and spent some time in the Career Development Village. Um, lots of great talks, lots of great speakers, and a really, really valuable initiative and approach to changing um, our industry and information security, which I'm a big fan of. Um, as uh, Hillary mentioned, I've spent a lot of my life in IT. I was a geek from very early ages and was fortunate enough to have lots of access to all sorts of solutions, uh, you know, old busted computers and different technologies, et cetera. Um, but what doesn't cover in there is I had a background in the hospitality industry for quite a bit. Uh, I spent about 20 years doing everything from working the door, attending bar, catering, et cetera. And a lot of my uh, analogies, stories, background, understanding, filter in what we do now comes through that. So I love being in customer facing, customer engaging roles and I've spent the last couple of years working at a variety of different vendors in that capacity. Um, that said, um, I've been around long enough to get a, a, a pretty good historical view of the culture and how things have evolved. And today we're gonna be talking about that culture and some of the things that I see that we really need to be working on changing. Um, I'll applaud all of you for being here because I think conferences, especially like this one, are a great step in that direction. But I think having an understanding of how things got built will help us to change them and evolve them. The other thing that um, you kind of need to know about me, and, and I'm going to give you a couple of caveats before we dive in, because uh, I'm going to have to ask for your help in a few things. Uh, I grew up in uh, punk. So uh, anybody ever been to a, a good punk show, spent some time in the pit? Outstanding. So um, knowing that, so in looking at me, as I'm going through this, at some point you're going to come to, to a moment where you're going to say, you look like you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Coming up through punk, um, I realized that part of my role in the pit was to, one, help everybody be safe in the pit, but also to clear space in the pit. So obviously, yeah, I, I definitely come from a certain degree of privilege. You know, I uh, used to come to conferences years and years ago, and everybody looked a lot like me. I love the fact that now that's changing, and that is definitely not the case here. But I understand that some of the stuff I'm going to talk about comes and is informed by coming from that position of privilege. So clearing that space, expanding that platform, building that capital. Okay. Second thing, uh, I'm going to use some examples from social media. Um, I've done my best to obscure the, those sources. I'm going to ask for your cooperation in not uh, digging in and trying to find those individuals. I'm not calling them out so that they can face repercussions or we can create more of a problem for them. I'm calling them out because when we're talking about culture, what are we talking about? We're talking about 
the, the day-to-day norms, behaviors, practices, beliefs that build in that culture. And one of the easiest ways as a, a analysis is to look at how we communicate and how we record that for ourselves, and social media provides a good way of doing that. So again, please don't go after those folks. If you are one of those folks, um, and even if you're not, or if there's anything that I say that you're like, hey, I really want to talk to you about that, that really pissed me off, that was really phenomenal, or I want to talk to you more, I'm here all week, come find me. I am a very approachable, come and talk to me. I love the feedback and I love the, the information. If you are one of those folks and you want me to take the post out of here, let me know and we can discuss it, okay? Any questions before we get started? All right, so starting off, not an InfoSec superhero. Cape's totally a joke. Um, I come out of a background where I know some stuff and I know that based on that, there's more that I don't know. And that's my jumping off point for many things. I'm also not talking about heroism. Uh, true heroism, I think there is definitely a place for heroism. I think there are definite heroes. I think there are people that do heroic things all the time, uh, sometimes on a grand scale, sometimes on a very publicly visible scale. And uh, I think there are heroes probably in the room today that it's trouble and heroic just to get out of bed in the morning, just to go into a toxic environment that you work in, just to deal with your day-to-day -day life people that struggle with problems that you have no way of seeing just looking at them. So I'm not talking about heroic action or true heroism. What we're talking about is hero culture. And hero culture in information security in particular as a cultural phenomenon and what I think is a overall toxic um, element toxic driver, toxic foundation, that creates a lot of the problems that we're seeing today. So we're gonna dive in a little bit. So firstly, thinking about hero culture, we see it all the time. In fact, uh, if you came through the airport or you bounce around and go to the conferences, we constantly see this messaging where people that do what we do are heroes. You know, um, It's in the advertising, it's in how we talk to each other. If you look at, for example, some of your corporate reward programs, it's heroes, rock stars, it's like you're exceptional. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with exceptional. Like Tanya was saying, good behavior, positive stuff, it's great to get reinforcement there. But you think about this from outside of our community or for people that are just joining the community and what does it do? It sets us up to say that heroes are on a different plane and in order to do this job, you've gotta be a hero. You know, you think about the classic constructs of heroes, especially now in movies and comic books and stuff like that. And heroes have some pretty sp specific traits. They're typically invulnerable. Maybe they have one vulnerability, kryptonite, Achilles heel, et cetera. There's one thing that can take them down. They typically work by themselves. Even when they work on teams, there's conflict within those teams. They typically have an alter ego and a different personality. All these things, are part of how we conceptualize heroes um, in our broader culture, but even more so, and these are provided as examples. Again, I'm not trying to, to dox or beat on anybody in particular. And it's an effective messaging. So it sells boxes and it sells software and it sells services. So, but it can be kind of problematic. So if you're questioning, do I work, do I live, am I in, currently in a hero culture, let me throw a couple of things here that may be signs that you are. Things like, oh, we work around the clock. This project won't finish until we work around the clock to get this done. So-and-so has to go above and beyond constantly to get things done. So last minute, uh, we had a crisis, we're in firefighting mode, we're constantly putting out fires, we're at 365, follow the sun model, et cetera, and we really saved the day, okay? Probably heard some, or some of those in your day-to-days. So again, not necessarily bad, but clues. So now why is this a problem? So what does culture do for us? What does culture really do in our day-to-day? 
Okay, you've often, you probably heard that, that culture beats strategy every time. You've probably worked in organizations that have had really good cultures, really positive cultures, maybe worked in some that didn't. What's, why is culture a differentiator for us? Well, culture really helps dictate what our day-to-day -day actions are, what our beliefs are, what our interactions with each other are, what our reward systems are. Okay? Culture, the culture that we live in, really provides all of the things that we need as human beings to thrive or not thrive in an environment. So it can be a problem if that culture is ultimately at its core toxic. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. Everybody's heard about the worker shortage. Everybody's heard about the fact that, that we have anywhere between 2.5 and 3.5 empty analyst chairs, et cetera. We need to attract people. We need to bring people in. If you're here all week, you are probably going to hear multiple things, multiple iterations of we need to bring people into cyber. We need to bring people into information security. We need to train them. We've got an opposition that is out there and growing. We need to bring people in. So. Um, all over the place. However, what are we bringing them into? And how do we get that, our rewards? So when thinking about how we register our, shall we say, our worth in those organizations, our appreciation, so where do we get that from? So, well, when you think about it, um, anybody familiar with Olds and Milner? So Olden Milner uh, did some really interesting work with uh, a thing called Skinner Boxes, where they took rats and stimulated rats to uh, hit a button to receive a stimulus that lit up the pleasure centers of their brains. So part of that research, and questionable research, sorry, questionable ethical research, part of that is we get as human beings stimulated we get great little chemical rushes when we are felt to be worth something, where our, our appreciation gets driven, okay? So working in a culture that makes us heroes, that feeds us that, oh my God, you completely saved the day. Nobody else could do it. You rushed in, you know, you, 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 you saved somebody from the burning building, et cetera, et cetera. It gives us as human beings a great little dopamine rush. Right? Anybody want to guess what happened to those rats with that button? Anybody know? They died. They kept hitting the button and hitting the button and hitting the button until they couldn't hit the button anymore. And they ignored everything else, food, procreation, safety, for that rush. So of course, who wouldn't want to be a hero? Who would not want to be on that pedestal and get that adoration? Okay. So, at a very basic level, heroes may be, uh, they may be well-intentioned, but our biology, our physiology alone helps us undermine and, and kind of feeds us some of the negative stuff that we're looking for. So I wanna dig into a couple of different things, some of this might sound familiar to you, about how this culture drives what our day-to-day -day looks like. So first off, heroes need villains. Okay, we need to have bad guys. Who's the bad guy for most information security practices? Is it APT? Is it the, the, the different organized crime groups? No, in a lot of cases, our bad guys are the users that we are designed to protect. The, the people that don't know and don't understand and don't appreciate security. Um, this creates, and Tanya alluded to it um, really, really well, this creates a separation between us and the rest of business. We sit in a silo off on ourselves. We sit in our, our fortress of solitude in our Justice League building. We separate ourselves out because we're different within that. So that need for an us and them mentality sets us apart and makes it harder for us to do our job. And think about the perception Think about the perception that most people in an organization have about information security in the midst of like a uh, phishing test campaign. Positive or negative? 
So how well do you think people adopt security practices when it's someone telling them, you're bad, you can't do that? So it doesn't resound very, very well. So creating that us and them mentality that's there because we are separate, because we need to be separate, because we feel good being separate. So it reinforces an elite mindset. You're gonna see L337 all the time. We're elite. So, but even amongst ourselves, we're elite. There's a stratification there. We separate ourselves out. And it places users and others uh, in a camp that says we're the only ones that can do it right because we're the only ones that hold the knowledge and the experience. So, well, that's not a way to actually move forward good security practice in an organization. We talk about it all the time. We probably heard it. It might be written on a letterhead somewhere. Security's everybody's job. Is it, is it really? Is it really? How much as security practitioners have we embraced to actually make that true, that security is somebody else's job? So it not only, and, and this is, again, where it gets kind of more toxic, it not only makes us feel superior, but what does it do? It belittles those individuals, and it locks them out of even wanting to come and join us um, and share their experience and their knowledge and their understanding. So it works hard to make sure that the, that essential relationship that we have with all of those other business units, all of those users, is confrontational. It does not help us. So, and of course, not everybody operates like this. Um, so the, the, the language that you see, you know, thinking about, and it's like, yeah, okay, look, it's frustrating having someone mash a button that creates a vulnerability, or that exploits a vulnerability, that creates an incident for us, and now my weekend's blown because you clicked a link in an email. It's still gonna happen, it's still the vector, but it's not because they're stupid and not because they're idiots. It's because we haven't taught them well enough to understand what it means to them. So, here is also build silos. Well, what am I talking about? So, um, there's an effort in that us and them mindset to separate us, but even in how we separate ourselves, we build silos of not only experience, but silos of knowledge, okay? It reinforces the need for the organizations to have us and to pay us what we get paid and to make sure that they're taking care of us as a priority because in what reality, in most cases, security practice is a cost center. It doesn't do much for the business except we mitigate risk. So in order to say, hey, look, don't forget about us. We need budget. We need attention. We separate ourselves in those, into those silos. So it pulls InfoSec further away from the core business, which what we really need is more and more, um, more and more buy-in, more and more place at the table. So if you look at the number of security practitioners and security knowledge at boards, in, in boardrooms, it's typically very low. Some of that I think is gonna change. The uh, SEC just sent out something on mandatory reporting. One of the interesting pieces of that, if you read into it, is that organizations are going to have to provide um, insight into what the rest of their board, not just their CISO, what the rest of their board's security, understanding, knowledge, and experience is as part of their reporting, not just around incidents, but as part of their annual reports. So that'll be interesting. So, and it builds resentment, again, in organizations. So not just individuals, but in business units. So um, sometimes it's, it's when you recognize it, um, it's a great place to drive change, but it comes, in my mind, part of where it comes from is from that essential mindset or culture. So here is also mask deeper problems. Um, if you think about it, if, if part of what your value system and how you derive, how you feel good about your job is that you rush in and save the day. We worked all weekend because this, this happened and we're killing ourselves for it. What's your incentive to do good documentation? What's your incentive to do proper network segmentation? What's your incentive to not have to firefight? There's very little incentive because the thing that you're getting, you're actually creating that. So anybody work somewhere where the documentation is absolutely phenomenal? Outstanding. So how did you get it that way? There you go. 
Um, it's rare. So documentation is bad. Anybody ever work somewhere where the answer to a problem was you had to go find one person that's been there long enough that they remember where the bodies are buried? So that, that one person has all the keys and knows how to get stuff done, that's far too common in organizations. Now, if look, our real goal is securing organizations, that's unacceptable. You know, first off, you can't take a day off. Secondly, that person, you can't get rid of them. They can't move on. And what happens if they retire? What happens when they leave? What happens when they win the lottery? So we have an incentive there to mask those problems and not ever fix that. So we're talking about ransomware resurgent in the last couple of years, and what are a lot of our fixes? The same things that we've been talking about forever, and none of it's particularly sexy or exciting. It's not like as, as fun as doing incident response. Proper network segmentation is boring, but it protects us, and we've been talking about it forever. You know, DNSSEC, when are we gonna implement that? It's not exciting. So we can't be driven by that rush, by that heroic mindset. So that time and effort to do those things, eh, you know what, we're going to sit and do nothing until the alarm bell rings and then we're going to jump into action because that's where we get recognized. So um, yeah, all right. We're going to get deeper, we're now getting into the deeper end of the pool of where toxic behavior actually starts impacting not only us, but other folks in, in our lives. So um, here's the problem, the reality is not everybody can be a hero. So um, this translates into plain and simple gatekeeping. Um, not only for people that are in doing what we're doing, so it's like, hey, I wanna jump from one team to another, I wanna expand what I'm doing, but gatekeeping in people that are new to cyber that are new to career, that are thinking about joining us. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of, I don't know if you can read all of this. So these are questions, uh, this is pulled out of a uh, thread of people that are sharing questions that they were asked for particular roles at a level. If you can read through it and kind of scan it, give me a, an idea of what level work you think this is, if this is like, you know, tier three, somebody with 10 years experience, et cetera, what level do you think these questions were appropriate to, or were being asked for? Yeah, there you go, excellent. Yeah, these are intern questions, so, which is insane. I mean, as an intern, it's like, man, you should have a willingness to show up and do the job, and we'll teach you the stuff. So, again, Outstanding questions. Um, anybody, so anybody currently interviewing? Anybody interviewing for roles? Getting some questions? Best of luck. Um, this, is, this is where I, I kind of divide the room. Anybody ever get the what happens when you Google question? Yeah, so the question's basically a, I'm gonna sit there and I'm gonna ask, hey, what happens when you Google? And it's a pretty broad question and those that use it say, Okay, the, the appropriate answer is scope the question. You know, I'm supposed to come back with, well, tell me what level of detail you want. But there's, there's a hidden piece in that question because when I ask you a question, I kind of have an answer in my mind that I'm expecting. If I ask you what happens when you Google, part of what you're trying to figure out is what my experience is. Am I a hardware person? Am I a software person? Am I a DNS advocate? What's my experience? You can, that can be a, a book in and of itself, but you've got to navigate what is going to resound to me. What's the answer that I need to hear from you that's going to demonstrate that you have technical capability? So, and a lot of interview questions are unfortunately that targeted that way. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need a good technical interview and a good technical understanding of can you do the job you know, but I think there are other ways of doing that. And it's not those broad questions that inspire um, us being on the same page. Um, and it's not doing work for free. So um, as you tr drill in, 
I've talked to many, many, many people. I was fortunate enough to be at a couple of different conferences with lots of new to cyber folks, and they are terrified. They get beat up constantly. They go through not only, not only in a lot of cases, you know, we're, we're all looking for one job for a thousand people, but it's a torturous system where it's like, how do I prep for this? How do I know all of the things, especially entry level? You shouldn't know all the things at entry level. You, know, you should learn that as we grow. And it, it has to be okay to not know something. So we'll come back to that. So again, you know, in-depth answers about, I'm like, okay. Those of us day to day that do some of this, it's like, could I answer that? No way in hell. Could Google it. You know, maybe my team together collaboratively we would come up with it, but kind of unfair. And it partially drives a mindset that there is no entry level in cyber. You have to have years and years and years of experience. It's the old joke of, of entry level must have a CISSP. You can't get a CISSP without years of experience and a reference, right? So you need to understand you know, cutting your teeth and other things. Now look, I, I was fortunate enough, I came up as a Windows admin, I came up as a desktop support person, I came up doing uh, exchange administration. I learned a lot of that stuff and that helped quite a bit in other things. Not everybody has that advantage and opportunity and that time. And there's some question as to how much of that is actually useful against the modern adversary. So, you need time. We don't have time. There's an enemy out there that we are actively engaged with. We need help now. I don't want to turn anybody off to coming into the career, and I certainly don't want to do this. But what is a lot of gatekeeping designed for? It's not saying we need quality control. It's saying you must be like me to do this job. Um, one of the things we'll get to, again, more examples. Sadly, this file of these examples is huge and ever growing. So, and encouragement. It's just like, hey, you know what? Get your experience, even if it's toxic, get some stuff under your belt. Uh, there are organizations that um, routinely, people know, are toxic and hellish places to work, but it's like, go do your two years there and that'll be your springboard into something else. Okay, now imagine we're not talking about work, we're talking about relationships. Okay, get into this abusive relationship and suffer it out for two years and then you'll be worth something to somebody. It's bullshit advice. So, um, I call this out, I used to at this point ask, does anybody knew, knew who Peter Zatko is? Anybody know? Okay, so Mudge, so phenomenal, testified in front of Congress multiple times, knows more about many, many things than I ever, ever will. Also a music major. <laughs> so, those backgrounds, that different thought, the different things that we know that you bring to the table help drive innovation, drive creativity, help us to solve for problems that we don't know are there yet. So this mindset of you must do nothing but be a purist and do this stuff, again, is also gatekeeping. So to that, while I'm finishing up there, um, one of the things that I thought was interesting, post 9-11, uh, there was a lot of research that was done as to why so many systems failed that should not have failed. And one of the things that they found was there was a culture in the intelligence and law enforcement community, and it's well-documented research, that really boiled down to homophily, where they were hiring the same person over and over and over again. And what that looked like was I would be hiring this person that looks and sounds like me. Okay. creating blind spots, um, interviewing people that fit the same pattern that I did. In fact, you look at the job requirements and it practically says you must look, walk, talk, act, know, like this, okay, in order to be successful here. It worked for a period of time when that's who we were fighting against, but that's not who our enemy is anymore, and that's why, part of why I failed. So that idea of homophily, that idea of I'm trying to hire myself over and over again at different points in my career, undermines and breaks teams, which takes us into heroes undermining teams. Anybody work with a brilliant jerk? 
outstanding. Anybody ever told, I know they're difficult to work with, but they know so much, we got to keep them? Um, so, yeah. Um, I think it's a pretty common experience. Um, it's hard to call this person out. Um, their behaviors oftentimes are accepted. A lot of times it's a, you can't put them in front of a customer. They make other people un uncomfortable. What kind of energy do they bring to meetings? What kind of energy do they bring to teams? So in a lot of cases, they inspire people to move on because they're tired of working with them. There's a great book uh, I have in the reference called uh, Asshole. That's kind of a, how you identify and help work with people. And look, I believe people can change and people can improve and you need to call out some of that behavior. Um, in a lot of cases, these individuals are unassailable. And whatever they do is signed off on and they blow teams up. They undermine the way teams function because they have to be the, for lack of a better term, the guy. So, and that's pointed. So, um, we see this, yeah, there you go. When you know, you know, right? We see this so much, even outside of our workplace, in the community, bad behavior that cuts people down and people chime in on it because it's like, oh, that's a stupid question. Why would you ever ask that? How is that possible? Blah, 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 blah. So, that bad behavior, that brilliant jerk mindset has been one of the core things that we've hired for for years. And time to move on. All right, so apologies in the next two sections. Some of this, if it triggers, I, I apologize. Um, hero culture also sets us up for really bad behavior. We're gonna talk about bad behavior in a minute, but really, really bad behavior. Um, far too often in a culture where you've got people that are unassailable, people that because they're brilliant, we tolerate the, the creepy behavior that they do, creepy and criminal behavior that we do. And a lot of the people that they do it to are not in a position of technical authority, authority experience that they can actually call out and change that behavior. We need as a community to take action there. And sometimes it's not fair, but it is essential because it damages people's lives. So that understanding that that environment where we even begin to accept it, you know, and, 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 and kind of sign off on it or do it quietly where you're like, hey, whatever you do, don't be in a room alone with that person. Okay, that's not where we should live. We work in security, security for everybody. If we can't secure and protect ourselves against threats in amongst us, we're, we're failing ourselves. Bad behaviors. Hero culture also sets us up for some pretty bad behaviors. Um, how many people have had conversations about the fact that we never sleep? Or I get where I wear two hours of sleep a night as a badge of honor, okay? This is common understood, CISOs don't sleep. Right? So CISOs, <laughs> you know, our expectation, our expectation is that if you're good at this, you don't sleep and you sacrifice everything to do the job. So going to cons, how many people are not planning on sleeping this week? There you go. So what's the, what's the rule? So uh, uh, three hours of sleep, two meals, one shower. Zero arrests, you know? It's like, okay, we still embrace that in the culture. In fact, it's kind of a badge of honor, you know, that you can, you can hit it hard. Uh, sales orgs, also pretty bad. Anybody, when you, okay, I'll throw this out there. Um, over this next week, there are gonna be vendor parties. How many of them have open bar? Almost all of them. So, um, there's a reason for that that hit it hard, party hard, work hard, play hard mindset. Um, yeah, that kind of works. Pandemic, for all of its ills, was actually, I think, pretty good because it helped show a lot of the problems that we have as a culture and what we encourage and the behaviors that we encourage. So 
being able to say, man, I'm really stressed. It's just like, well, wait a minute. Now you're going to, you're going to, you're going to say that you're collapsing under the pressure of working for 72 hours in an investigation. And look, as a manager, I know you're not, you're no longer effective. I need to pull you back out of that. Okay. You're no longer doing a good job. So that kind of mindset, um, hurts us as people and hurts people that are new to it because they aspire to it and that becomes, again, how they operate because that's how we demonstrate this is what is success. So the answering emails at four o'clock in the morning thing is, is, seems almost harmless, but I've had people on my team that are like, I can't not respond to that. I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna think about it until I respond to it. So what do you do in spare time? No spare time. What are you doing to protect your mental health? Okay. When was the last time you had a manager or anybody ask you, when's your next day off? Or mandate taking some time off? Or pull you off of an engagement? No, we're driven by that timeline, that deadline, that whole bit. That's how we're measured. And we're expected to be invulnerable. So, which feeds into the fact that we're irreplaceable. I have to be here. If I'm not doing it, nobody else is doing it. This, in my mind, is what we call command failure. I don't have enough people to do the job. I don't have enough people to do the job that you're asking me to do. So I'm asking people to step outside. Now look, the reality is you're going to have those times. So we are all going to run to it. But it should not be the standard. It should be the norm. What we're being asked to do in many cases is that's the standard and to do more with less and less and less. So, yeah. This mindset, again, to thank you, uh, for new folks. It's like, yeah, you know what? Sacrifice everything for a couple of years until you get in and then you can back off the pedal a little bit. Yeah, but by that point, you've already developed those behaviors and patterns. Heroes burn out in a big way. All of those things lead to some really bad stats on our mental health as a community. Um, Panaman did a great, uh, great research in 2022 about depression and anger and things like alcoholism and not getting, not getting mental health assistance that we need. Um, we're setting ourselves up for it. Hero culture sets us up for this. You know, you can see it. Even, even in popular media, you can see that heroes are conflicted and burned out sometimes. But this is what we're setting ourselves up for. And it perpetuates itself. It turns into turnover. So what do we do when we get tired of a job? We move on, move on to another job. We don't try to improve where we're at or improve ourselves or even take time for ourselves or look out for each other in those regards. Because I don't want to signal weakness in myself, right? I don't want to be vulnerable and signal that to you. It would be terrible. So if you look through the list, those might resonate for you. Um, I'm fighting some time here. If you look at this list again, this is uh, the Panaman from 2021. We're like five down on the list before we even get to a highly technical piece or talk about the enemy. So who's doing the most harm to us? Not the bad guy. So, summing up. Um, heroes need villains, build silos, create exclusion, mass deeper problems, they undermine teams, disempower folks, they reduce accountability, and we eventually burn out. But there's hope. Uh, first time I did this uh, internally for a bunch of folks, they're like, man, that's really bleak. You gotta give me something. So, um, how do we make a change? Well, first off, I think you're already doing that. You're here, which is outstanding. Um, my hope is that you're gonna take something away from this and look at those cultures and try to sort out how to get changed. I'm gonna hopefully give you some resources. Things you can do is understanding that culture, even looking at the culture. Um, update recruiting and hiring to be a little more tolerant, a little more accepting, a little more welcoming. Um, uh, even down to like appropriate job descriptions that are not exclusive, that, that don't exclude people that may be exactly the person you're looking for. 
uh, transform that heroic behavior into a transformational opportunity, like take the energy that you're putting into that and put that into transforming. Uh, eliminate and educate brilliant jerks. Uh, I'd like to say people can evolve, but some can't. Um, build collaborative, healthy, diverse teams. This is kind of my passion. Um, adopt good behaviors that will model that for other people. Hey, you know what? I'm taking time off. I'm going to my therapist. I'm going for a walk. I'm going for a swim. So build social capital for everybody. This makes it easier to make some of those changes. So pass the mic, pass the marker, all those mindsets so that you're not the only one in the room. So whether you're um, whether you've already got a voice, make, make that available for everybody else. Open the doors. So implement DNI as an as a essential KPI. Um, update recognition awards. So get away from hero-based awards. Talk about, hey, they came in on time, under budget, you know, a week early, et cetera, rather than the above and beyond stuff. And act in the community. A um, Couple of different things, if you're not familiar. Uh, bystander intervention is phenomenal as a tactic. Five uh, Ds, there's a lot there, and I'll have links out on the site. Um, and you'll see like changes in code of conduct. Um, it's interesting how many times, especially at conferences, people push back um, on having an active code of conduct that's beyond don't be a jerk. So there are lots of organizations, this is not fully exclusive, that I think are doing a phenomenal job. You'll notice, like Diana Initiative, many are here and helping to change that and move that. So jump in and help them. And this is my big one. Um, I'm just spinning this up with a group of my friends. Um, after giving this talk, they're like, you gotta give me one thing. Um, so the one thing for me is, it's important to know that you don't know everything and it's important to know that everybody needs help. We work as teams, we collaborate as teams. In fact, that interaction as a team does great things, that dopamine rush, the Skinner boxes, that interaction with teams gives us kind of the same thing. So I know sometimes that's difficult for folks, but we all need help. One of the things that I look for in hiring is someone that's not afraid to say that they don't know the answer, but I can go find it. So that integrity, that curiosity matched with that integrity. So if I can give you one thing to walk out of here today with is making it okay to ask for, ask for help, okay? Not just making yourself available to answer questions, but ask questions. And if you're in a room where even you know the answer but you think somebody else might not, this is a great way to give them part of the platform. So okay to ask for help. So just spinning this up, I've got stickers in the back. Um, feel free to go out, check out the mission. We're just getting it kind of spun up. So, and please give me feedback. Um, there's lots of links in the site to get there. Um, hoping to have some blog posts and a few other things out there soon. Um, a bunch of other resources. Uh, I've got a couple of different swag things and we'll be taking questions after. I know that's a lot to absorb. Um, I believe that we can make a difference and I believe that we can shift a lot of those changes in small ways to eventually kind of get there. And that's it. Anybody, thank you. Questions? I have swag for questions. No questions. Wow. Excellent, would you uh, grab the mic, do you mind? Oh, sorry. Ask away. Sure, so I, I guess the first question is, have you seen a toxic workplace become untoxic? Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, not so much, uh, I've seen teams that have kind of put a stake in the ground and started trying to build that and demonstrating to, to folks, hey, we collaborate, this is how we operate, and you slowly bring people into that, and that slowly starts to permeate um, out into the other parts of the org, so I've seen it be effective that way. Um, not always easy, and not always, you know, not always support, but it doesn't always have to be top down, you know? And I think we've seen it in the community itself. I think we've seen people raise their voices and say, hey, we need a code of conduct. We need, you need to have some way for us to report bad behavior. So, and I think we've seen that even, even like Hacker Summer Camp. 
So, yeah, I've seen some good some good examples of that personally. Right. Yeah, they're they're not going to go. So the, the 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 question there is like, okay, well, how do you how do you get them to not again culture culture beats strategy all the time. So I think it's a question of we starve them out. It's like if you know there's a company that has a toxic culture and they've got a okay product, don't go to work for them. Go to work for their competition that has a better culture. Don't put your energy and resources into something that you know is harmful. You know, put your energy and stuff behind better solutions and better ways to go than still feeding them. There are there are we were, uh, having a conversation last night. There are some consulting orgs that are known to be toxic that people continue to go to because it's a great way to start. We need, a, we need an alternative, you know? So let's start an alternative. Let's find a way, and it's like starve them of their talent. Cut them, cut them off, cut them off at the root. So great question. Any others? Uh, if you don't mind, they're trying to record. presentation was great. We Thank talk you. about this all the time with my friends. Um, one question is, for someone that has been in the industry and has seen many problems with this and what you guys kind of talk about today, right. what advice would you have for someone that is kind of struggling with that burnout, that has been in cybersecurity and maybe questioning, should they get out? What should they do? Should they take time off? And has had the hero. Right. Yeah. Suffered the suffered yeah. the consequence. Look, I I am a big fan of uh, building teams, finding other people. So uh, this is one of the great things about here. It's like a lot of times we feel like, hey, well, I'm the only one that's suffering from this, or the only one that's exposed to it. You can find allies and people that have had that experience, and really prioritizing yourself. You know, knowing that it's just like, hey, you know, nothing, no, no job is worth your mental health and your well-being, you know. So asking for help, asking other, other folks, hey, just like we would do in a technical question, it's like, hey, how, how, have, how have you navigated this? Um, I will tell you one of the things that, that I, I see changing is um, that focus on mental health and folks calling it out in events like this, and I think there's, there's a lot there. So, you know, just kind of open yourself up to it, and don't be afraid to be vulnerable and expose that. So, thank you. Uh, I think we'll take questions out in the hallway if need be, but thank you, and thank you to Diana Initiative, and to uh, uh, Hillary and the rest of the team. So, I appreciate it, and thank you all of you. Uh, appreciate your attention. <laughs>